If you're introverted, could you actually be autistic? And if you've got autism, are you by definition introverted? The answers might surprise you, and the reasons behind those answers might surprise you even more. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And though I had no idea back in the time, I've got autism. But if you ask 99% of the people who meet me, they'll describe me as reserved, quiet, and introverted. And even though it's clearly the majority view, I take exception with it as being wrong. But to understand why, we need to understand what it actually means to be introverted. Introversion is a personality trait where an individuals prefer solitary or small group activities as opposed to larger social gatherings. These are generalizations, of course, but in general, introverts might prefer one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions over large groups. They might feel more comfortable in solitary or low stimulation environments. When presented with a choice, they might opt for reflection and introspection over interaction. When I was a little kid, way back in about third grade, my best friend Tony and I would steal material from Saturday Night Live or Mad Magazine and put on our own version of a classroom news update. We'd push a big credenza up to the front of the class to serve as a news desk and do the whole bit. And each day I had a story ready for show and tell just so I could be up in the front of the classroom and on days where truly nothing had happened, I'd just fabricate something to just get the chance to perform. But then something interesting happened. As I got older, and moved on up through the grades, I didn't progress socially at the same rate as the other kids. Being smart helped, but I was also a little bit less mature than my neurotypical peers. It seems that once kids break off into cliques and groups, they craft an intricate social dance of what it means to be cool, and I just wasn't much of a dancer. I generally got along better with adults than I did with kids my own age, and at least the adults are usually more patient. Because I don't want to shock you, but tolerance and patience are not the words I would use to describe how middle school students generally treat the autistic kid. Everyone's experience is uniquely different, but if there's a common thread, I suspect that middle school and high school are the hardest parts of an autistic person's life, oftentimes. But simply, kids that age can be dicks, and anybody who is markedly different from the crowd takes the brunt of that abuse. This isn't a pity party, and as far as I can tell, I had the last laugh anyway. But it wasn't without a lot of formative years where I learned that making social faux pas can be painful. If every time you reach out socially at a young age, you get your hand slapped, eventually you learn to be cautious. You learn to listen more than you talk, and you learn to avoid scenarios that need a punching bag. Basically, your experience is that being socially extroverted, regardless of your instincts, is generally not rewarded and is actively often punished. So my contention then is that in this case, I'm actually a moderate extrovert, but with autism. I realize that might sound contradictory to some folks, so allow me to explain. I look forward to most social events, and I don't dread them, as long as there will be interesting people there. Extroverted or not, I'm just not a big fan of standing around and talking about the weather. But if I get the chance to talk to somebody interesting about a topic in which I'm also interested and that they know a lot about, I can get lost in conversation for hours. To a certain extent, and I speculate this is related to my ASD, I categorize people by what they do and what they know how to do. So rather than remembering that Jimmy is Fran's cousin on Kevin's side, I'll remember that Jimmy translates technical manuals from Japanese to English. And I'll never forget that, unlike his name, how I know him, and through what social channels. So I sense there are different imperatives in conversation for somebody with ASD, but I enjoy it nonetheless. Prior to COVID, I had always assumed that I was introverted by definition and therefore didn't need any social contact. I thought at first I was immune to the needs of being able to sit and at least have a beer with a friend once a week, but I wasn't. However, as much as I look forward to and often enjoy the right types of social situations, they're still draining if I must mask, which is pretty much everywhere all the time. Masking is the act of appearing normal, or to put it more gently, mirroring the traits, reactions, and mannerisms of neurotypical people. And it's work. Worse, it's work that doesn't come very naturally, and as a result, it's draining. I'm masking like crazy right now, in case that hasn't always been obvious. And the great thing about having a YouTube channel is that I have to edit a big chunk of video featuring my best masking every week. And so I'm able to review and grade my own performance and tweak it where I think it needs it. Sometimes I'll say something in a video where I think I conveyed it with great import or even emotion, but then upon watching the video back, I just don't see it. There's often a disconnect in autism between what you're feeling and what you're telegraphing to others. And masking winds up being a conscious effort at ensuring that you're sending the right and necessary signals to the neurotypical people that you're interacting with. All those social mannerisms and traits and looks and gestures are useful amongst the neurotypical as well, which is of course why they evolved in the first place. 
but with a bit of practice, they become second nature to them, unlike in individuals with autism where these same things require concentration and conscious effort. I can be on for about three hours, at which point I really need to be away from people, sit with my laptop, veg out for a little bit, work on a script or some code to decompress or something like that. And I'm sure that by the end of a three hour session, even my masking would be wearing a little thin. My affect, largely by virtue of my facial expressions and speaking, might start to appear flat and disinterested. It doesn't actually mean I've become disinterested, just that I've become tired of faking all the signals that you neurotypical people normally associate with interest. For people with ASD, masking and socializing can be like working out. Depending on the individual, you might absolutely hate it or you might love it and find it invigorating. But in both cases, it's real work, and when it's done, you need to rest and recover. And like working out, the more you do it, the easier it gets and the more you're capable of, but only to a point. For me, then, the distinction is about preference and ability. As in most ways, my wife and I are polar opposites when it comes to being introverted or extroverted. She's about as far from being on the spectrum as I think you can be, and I rely on her for everything from basic executive functioning to helping me navigate complex social situations that might be above my pay grade. She's a social butterfly, a bullion outgoing and quick to make friends. She remembers everyone's name and where they fit into the web of relationships that form our local community. Her appetite for social interaction is far more voracious than my own, and she finds it almost exclusively energizing and not like work at all. She's a good example of being extroverted. She has both the preference and the ability. Consider, on the other hand, a true introvert. Somebody who, given the option of going to the library for three hours versus going to see a well-reviewed play with friends, will pick the library every time. It's their specific preference to have far less social interaction than an extrovert would, regardless of their ability to conduct it when needed. And that's where I fit in, right in the middle of what looks to be a bit of a paradox. I enjoy social interaction, but find it hard work, and have a certain amount of reticence to enter into it. I have the preference, but lack some of the ability. And perhaps in the case of actually having ASD, that rises to the level of a disability. As for me, I'd go to the play. But when the play is done, I'm likely near done myself. There's a natural tendency for such groups to gather for dinner afterwards, and that's likely where I would need to beg off. I can do one or the other and enjoy it. But trying to do both becomes work, and I wind up literally feeling trapped and wondering how I can escape and get back to my own space without the demands from people. Now, my dad had cerebral palsy, and I learned one overarching thing about disability as a result. He rejected the term disabled. When he was told that he couldn't join the school band because he wouldn't be able to manage an instrument with his tremors, he learned to play the hardest instrument he could think of, a saxophone, and went on to play professionally as a young man. He couldn't write very legibly with a pen, but he could bang out a perfect letter with just his left hand on a mechanical typewriter and nobody was the wiser. And so in the language of the day, he saw his cerebral palsy as a handicap rather than a disability. It made it a lot harder, but not impossible. I look at the social disability that accompanies ASD in a similar fashion. If you can fake it until you make it and you're comfortable with the choice to mask in social situations, then the odds are that you can overcome much of it, even if it's an uphill struggle that takes a lot of work. Those that cannot or will not may come to find themselves facing much more than just a struggle. It may be a dimension in which they struggle so much to the point of truly manifesting it as a disability. So if you're introverted, you prefer limited social interaction because that's simply who you are. It has nothing to do with your ability to participate in it, it's just that you choose not to. With autism, it's more about your ability to do so and the psychic costs of doing so. That doesn't preclude people from being any combination of autistic versus neurotypical and introverted versus extroverted. It really means that we extract preference and ability as new dimensions. So what do autism and particle physics have in common? Well, when something doesn't fit the current narrative, you simply add a new dimension to the equations. In this case, however, social difficulties are already well known as part of the DSM-5 definition of autism, so they're already well accounted for and there's no need to add them to the spectrum. And since I contend that introversion is not an autism characteristic on its own, we won't be adding that one either. If you do have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum, however you define success. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known way back then. If you enjoyed today's episode, please let me know by subscribing to the channel. It really helps the channel growth and it tickles me right in my dopamine when you do it. I'll also ask that if you're already subscribed that you double check to ensure that you haven't been unknowingly unsubscribed, then I encourage you to turn on all notifications for that subscription so you don't miss any important episodes. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. 
In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.